This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 13 for June 19 to 25, The New Covenant Life, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, June 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the beginning, when everything went wrong, as we read in your word, the decision was made that your Son Jesus would come, that each of us could have the opportunity of eternal life. And as it says in our memory verse, he came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. And Lord, I pray for each person who's listening to this podcast today, whether they're in San Antonio, Texas, uh, whether they're in Colombia, uh, whether they're in Ghana or Montevideo, I pray, Lord, that each of us may know that you are the God who not only created the world, but provided the way of salvation for each of us. May your Holy Spirit guide us and bless us as we study your word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is John 10 and verse 10. I am come that they might have life, and they might have it more abundantly. Let's read that again, John 10, 10. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. This quarter has been a study of the covenant, which, to pare it down to its simplest, purest form, is basically God saying, this is how I will save you from sin, period. Though the outcome... The grand finale of the covenant promise is, of course, eternal life in a world made new. We do not have to wait until that time to enjoy the covenant blessings today. The Lord cares about our lives now. He wants the best for us now. The covenant is not some deal where you do this and this and this and then a long way off you'll get your reward. The rewards, the gifts, they are blessings that those who by faith enter into the covenant relation can enjoy here and now. This week's lesson, the final in our series on the covenant, looks at some of these immediate blessings, some of the promises that come from God's grace shed into our hearts, because having heard him knock, we have opened the door. Of course... There are more blessings than what we can touch on this week. It is just a start, the start of something that will indeed never end. And here are the questions in the week at a glance. Why should we feel joy? On what basis can we claim that promise? What is it about the covenant that should free us from the burden of guilt? And what does it mean to have a new heart? Sunday, June 20, Joy. Our text for today is 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Look at what John wrote here. In a few simple words, he expresses what should be one of the great advantages we, as covenant people, have. And that is the promise of joy. As Christians, we are often told not to go by feeling, that faith is not feeling, and that we need to get beyond our feelings, all of which is true. But at the same time, we would not be human beings if we were not creatures of feelings, emotions and moods. We cannot deny our feelings. What we need to do is understand them, give them their proper role, and as much as possible, keep them under control. But to deny them is to deny what it means to be human. We might as well tell a circle not to be round. Indeed, as this verse says, not only should we have feelings, in this case joy, but they also should be full. It hardly sounds as if feelings are to be denied, does it? 
Read the context of the above verse. Starting at the beginning of the chapter, what was John writing to the early Christians that he hoped would make their joy full, and why should it give them joy? So let's start right back at the beginning of that chapter in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard from him, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. And our text for today, verse 4 again, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. John was one of the original twelve. He was there almost from the start of Christ's three-and-a-half-year ministry, a witness to some of the most amazing events of Jesus' life. John was there at the cross, at Gethsemane, and at the Transfiguration as well. Thus, as an eyewitness, he was certainly well qualified to talk about this subject. Yet notice, too, that the emphasis is not on himself. It is on what Jesus had done for the disciples, so they can now have fellowship not only with each other, but also with God himself. Jesus has opened the way for us to enter into this close relationship with the Lord, and one result of this fellowship, this relationship, is joy. John wants them to know that what they've heard about Jesus is true. He saw, touched, felt, and heard him. And thus they, too, can enter in a joyful relationship with their heavenly Father, who loves them and gave himself through his Son for them. And so to finish today, in a certain sense, John is giving his own personal testimony. What is your own testimony regarding your relationship with Jesus? What could you say that could help increase someone's joy in the Lord as John sought to do here? Monday, June 21, guilt-free. Romans 8 verse 1, our text for today reads, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. A young woman had been brutally murdered, her killer unknown. The police, setting a trap, placed a hidden microphone in her grave. One evening, many months after her death, a young man approached the grave and, kneeling and weeping, begged the woman for forgiveness. The police, of course, monitoring his words, nabbed him for the crime. What drove the man to the grave? It was guilt. Of course, though none of us, we hope, has ever done anything as bad as what that young man did, we all are guilty. We all have done things we are ashamed of, things that we wish we could undo but cannot. Thanks to Jesus and the blood of the new covenant, none of us has to live under the stigma of guilt. 
According to the text for today, there is no condemnation against us. The ultimate judge counts us as not guilty, counts us as if we have not done the things we feel guilty about. How do these following verses help us understand Romans 8.1? First of all, we'll read Romans 8.1 again. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And the other texts are John 5.24, Most assuredly I say to you, He who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. And Romans 3.24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. One of the great promises of living in a covenant relationship with the Lord is that we no longer have to live under the burden of guilt. Because of the blood of the covenant, we, who choose to enter into that covenant relationship with God, who choose to abide by the conditions of faith, repentance, obedience, can have the burden of guilt lifted. When Satan seeks to whisper in our ears that we are evil, that we are bad, that we are too sinful to be accepted by God, we can do what Jesus did when Satan tempted him in the wilderness. We can quote scripture. And one of the best of all verses to quote is Romans 8, 1, which is our text for today. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This does not mean denying the reality of sin in our lives. It means instead, because of the covenant relationship we have with the Lord, we no longer live under the condemnation of that sin. Jesus paid the penalty for us, and he now stands in the presence of the Father, pleading his own blood on our behalf, presenting his own righteousness instead of our sins. And so, to finish today... What difference does it make in your life that the Lord has forgiven you for whatever sins you might have committed? How does that reality help you in dealing with others who have sinned against you? How should it impact the way you deal with those people? Tuesday, June 22. New Covenant and New Heart. Our text for today is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. As earlier studies this quarter showed, the new covenant is one in which the Lord puts the law in our hearts, as we read in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 33. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds, and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Not only is the law there, but also according to the texts for today, Christ is as well which, of course, makes good sense, for Christ and his law are closely connected. 
Thus, with Christ's law in our hearts, and with Christ dwelling there too, the Greek word translated in the above text as dwell also means to settle in, giving the idea of permanency. We come to another one of the great covenant benefits, a new heart. Why do we need a new heart? What changes will be manifested in those who have a new heart? Read again the text for today. Notice that Paul stresses the element of love, saying that we must be rooted and grounded in it. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. These words imply stability, firmness and permanency in the foundation of love. Our faith means nothing if it is not rooted in love for God and love for others. As we read in Matthew 22, 37-39, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. And whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror, dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three but the greatest of these is love. This love does not come in a vacuum. On the contrary, it comes because we get a glimpse of God's love for us, a love that passeth understanding as manifested through Jesus. As a result, by him working in us, our lives are changed, our hearts are changed, and we become new people with new thoughts, new desires and new goals. Our reaction to God's love for us enables Him to change our hearts and instill in us love for others. Perhaps this is what Paul means, at least partially, when he talks about us being filled with the fullness of God. Read 1 John 4.16. How does this text relate to what Paul has written in Ephesians 3.17-19? First of all, 1 John 4, 16, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. And our text for today again, Ephesians 3, beginning at verse 17, That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length, and depth, and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And so to finish today, look at the text we've studied today. 
What can you do that will allow the promises of these texts to be fulfilled in you? Are there things you need to change, things that are perhaps hampering you from experiencing the fullness of God, as we just read in Ephesians 3.19? Make a list of what changes you need to make in your life. Make one for yourself, and if you are comfortable, make one that you could share with the class. How can you help each other make necessary changes? Wednesday, June 23, New Covenant and Eternal Life. Our text for today is John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Let's read this again from the New American Standard Bible. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. John 11, 25 and 26. There are two dimensions to eternal life. The present dimension brings to the believer an experience of the abundant life now, which includes the many promises that we have been given for our lives now. John 10.10 The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The future dimension is, of course, eternal life, the promise of the resurrection of the body. As we read in John 5, verses 28 and 29, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And in chapter 6 of John, verse 39, This is the will of of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Though still in the future, that is the one event that makes everything else worth it, the one event that caps all our hopes as Christians. Study the verse for today. What is Jesus saying here? Where is eternal life found? How do we understand his words that those who live and believe in him, even if they die, will never die? I am the resurrection and the life in John eleven twenty five and 26. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And so we look at Revelation 2, verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And Revelation 20, verse 14. Then death and hate were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And Revelation 21 verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Of course, we all die. But according to Jesus, this death is only a sleep a temporary hiatus that, for those who believe in him, will end in the resurrection of life. When Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise immortal, and the living followers of Christ will, in the twinkling of an eye, be changed into immortality. Both the dead and the living who are Christ's will possess the same kind of resurrection body. Immortality begins at that time for God's people. What a great joy to know now that our end is not in the grave, but that there is no end, that we will have a new life that lasts forever. 
As we read in the book The Desire of Ages, page 388, Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because through faith his life has become ours. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God, received into the heart by faith, is the beginning of the life eternal. End of quote. And so to finish the day, in what ways can we now enjoy the benefits of eternal life? In other words, what does this promise do for us now? Write down some of the benefits this promise of eternal life gives to you personally in your day-to-day -day life. How could you take this hope and promise and share it with someone who is struggling, perhaps with the death of a loved one? Thursday, June 24, New Covenant and Mission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, we read in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. All over the world, people often struggle with what South African writer Lawrence van der Post called the burden of meaninglessness. People find themselves with the gift of life, yet they do not know what to do with it, do not know what the purpose of this gift is, and do not know how to use it. It is like having someone in a library filled with rare books – only to have the person not read the books, but use them to build fires. What a terrible waste of something so precious. For the New Covenant Christian, however, that problem is not one they need to struggle with. On the contrary, those who know and have personally experienced the wonderful news of a crucified and risen Saviour who died for the sins of every human being everywhere, that they all might have eternal life, know joy. Considering the unequivocal call in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, the believer certainly has a mission and purpose in life, and that is to spread to the world the wonderful truth he or she has personally experienced in Christ Jesus. What a privilege! Almost anything else we do in this world will end when this world does. But spreading the gospel to others is a work that will make an imprint on eternity. Talk about a sense of mission and purpose. And that's the whole mission and purpose of this podcast of the Sabbath School Lesson. Break down the verses for today into their various elements. What are the specific things Jesus is telling us to do, and what is involved in each one? What promise do we have that should give us the faith and courage to do what Christ commands? And I've chosen to read Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20 from a modern English version, the God's Word translation. So wherever you go, Make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am always with you until the end of time. Let's read that again. So wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to do everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am always with you until the end of time. And so to finish today, as New Covenant Christians, we have been given a clear mandate by the Lord himself. Whoever we are, whatever our station in life, whatever our limits, we can all play a role. Have you been doing anything? Can you do more? What can your class do together 
to have a greater role in this work. Friday, June 25. From the Bible Echo and Signs of the Times, August 1, 1892, and this would have been written by Ellen White while she was here in Australia, The Holy Son of God had no sins or griefs of his own to bear. He was bearing the griefs of others, for on him was laid the iniquity of us all. Through divine sympathy, he connects himself with man, and as the representative of the race, he submits to be treated as a transgressor. He looks into the abyss of woe, open for us by our sins, and proposes to bridge the gulf of man's separation from God. And by the same author, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 353. Come, my brother, come just as you are, sinful and polluted. Lay your burden of guilt on Jesus, and by faith claim his merits. Come now, while mercy lingers. Come with confession, come with contrition of soul, and God will abundantly pardon. Do not dare to slight another opportunity. Listen to the voice of mercy that now pleads with you to arise from the dead, that Christ may give you light. Every moment now seems to connect itself directly with the destinies of the unseen world. Then, let not your pride and unbelief lead you to still further reject offered mercy. If you do, you will be left to lament at the last. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And that brings us to our two, three discussion questions for this week. One, we see ourselves in relation to the cosmos, wrote Francisco José Moreno, and we are aware of our ignorance and final powerlessness, hence our insecurity. As a result, we fear. And that's from page seven of Between Faith and Reason, Basic Fear and the Human Condition. Compare this statement with what you studied this week in Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Discuss the differences between the two sentiments. 2. God promises us joy as believers in Jesus. Is joy the same as happiness? Should we always be happy? If we are not, is there something wrong with our Christian experience? What can the life of Jesus reveal that will help us understand the answers to these questions? And 3. Discuss further this idea of being filled with the fullness of God as we read in Ephesians 3.19. What does that mean? How can we experience this in our lives? Verse 19 again, To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. And to summarise this week's lesson, and perhaps the whole quarter, the covenant is not just some deep theological concept. Instead, it defines the parameters of our saving relationship with Christ, a relationship that reaps us wonderful benefits now and at his return. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled God is Real and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Christian Suarez started using drugs at the age of 14 in Colombia. By 18, he was a hardcore drug user and an up-and-coming rock star after winning an audition to join a well-known rock group. He thought he had reached the top 
playing to wild crowds in sold-out soccer stadiums. When he turned 21, he decided to go solo, and his dreams collapsed. After a daunting year on his own, he was left with no money or home. He moved back in with his mother. Drugs seemed to be his sole refuge. Christian had never believed in God, but sad, lonely and alone at home, he lifted up his eyes and said, Lord, I don't know who you are, I don't even believe in you, but if you are real, if you really exist, I need you to tell me. If you tell me I am real, I will follow you. At that precise moment, his cell phone rang. Hello, could I please speak with Christian Suarez? An older woman said. You were speaking to him, he said. How can I help you? Christian, I've called to tell you that God is real, she said. Christian was shocked. The caller had said the exact words that he had asked from God in order to believe in him. What's your name? he asked. He didn't recognise her name, Nulbia, when she first gave it. She said she was the 65-year-old sister of one of his musician friends, Leonardo. Why did you tell me precisely those words? Christian asked. She said Christian had visited her home for the first time two weeks earlier to pick up her brother for a rehearsal. That night she prayed, Lord, that man needs you. She got Christian's phone number from her brother and, two weeks later, felt impressed to call. She prayed, Lord, use me, and made the call. Christian excitedly called another friend, Alfonso, to tell him about the phone call. Alfonso got a strange sound in his voice and asked Christian to come over to his house. He met Christian with a Bible in his hand. Christian was surprised. Alfonso had never mentioned God in the years that they had been friends. That night, Alfonso gave him a thorough Bible study about Seventh-day Adventist beliefs. It turned out that Alfonso wanted to become an Adventist. Three months later, Christian was baptised and free of drugs. Today, a decade later, he is studying to become a pastor at Columbia Adventist University in Medellin, Colombia. Alfonso also has joined the Adventist Church. Christian no longer has any doubt about God. Nothing is impossible for God, he said. And there's a lovely photograph of uh, the young man here, Christian. This quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a missionary training centre at Columbia Adventist University. And I trust that this series of lessons has been an inspiration for you, as it has been for me, to once again reiterate how much God loves us, cares for us, and is always there with us. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.